and we have more drinks, and then after that, but the discussion starts. So thank you again. My name is Yael Wosowski. During the day, I am program manager for European Students for Liberty. So events like this going on all over Europe are awesome, are great, and are pretty much why I do what I do. So during the day, I do that. I'm in contact with all the groups all over Europe. We have over 220 now in cities as diverse as Sofia, Bulgaria, to parts of Finland and Turkey that I've never heard of. So that's uh, really encouraging and really great. And I moonlight at night, uh, European night, American day, as a journalist in the United States. I write articles for Pan American Post and also for Watchdog.org. I write about normally, whether it be Bitcoin or also talking about state government and holding public officials accountable. And I also write a lot about Canada and what's going on there, where I'm originally from, because I think it's just really interesting. And, and I think if we continue to go on this path of American dominance and always talking about America, that's a little boring for the rest of us in the world who are not American. So I would like to thank Austrian uh, Libertarian Movement for asking me to do this and uh, working with me in tandem to get this out. And I guess I will just go on from here. The title is The Promise of Bitcoin, Alternative Currencies and Anonymous Markets. Now many of you might be here for different reasons. Some of you are ardent libertarians, some of you are just interested in cryptocurrencies and alternative currencies or finance in general. So thank you very much for coming and now we shall begin. Now I don't really have the stellar, the best definition for Bitcoin ever. I don't really think uh, anyone really has a good one on their own, but one that I've been able to put together is Bitcoin, the decentralized digital currency engineered with the latest in cryptographic protections and is used as an alternative to the current monetary system which we really like, by thousands of tech entrepreneurs and curious digital natives since it was conceived in 2009. This is something that anyone can use, anyone can plug up. It takes one second, one minute to download a wallet, to transfer money. It's not too difficult, but again, if you don't live on the internet like most of us do, it might be difficult. But yet, I believe that Bitcoin is something very interesting that our generation specifically can use to really push our message of freedom, of individual liberty, of alternative monetary systems, whatever floats your boat. So it is open source. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. When you guys are out downloading movies and stuff, it's using the same technology as that, but for transactions, for money. It was developed by someone named Satoshi Nakamoto, that is uh, obviously a pseudonym. No one really knows who it is. Uh, people like to have all these kind of theories. There's a good article that was posted uh, just the other day on Light in a Mirror, Thoughts on Computing by some blogger who actually came up with some pretty interesting evidence that it was Nick Zabo, who's uh, this huge academic uh, sort of cryptocurrency guy and sort of dropped off the face of the earth uh, as soon as Bitcoin was introduced. So there are a lot of theories no one really knows. It exists in a white paper that came out called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. If you have not read that, it's very easy to do. Go to bitcoin.org and it should be linked there. It's an interesting academic introduction to all the things that we'll be talking about and everything that Bitcoin is. Now, how many of you have Bitcoins in your possession as of this moment? And you guys. I'll get to that in a, in a minute because... The whole thing about value, that's the number one important thing now for everyone else, whereas the more important message is more using Bitcoin as a means to get to a certain end. So I'll get to that. And one thing that really makes Bitcoin different from all the other currencies in the world is when Bitcoin was first introduced, the only way to sell it to people really was to show pictures like this of gold coins with Bitcoin on it. And it looks so great and it looks alternative and new and something, something amazing. It doesn't have... The, the Austrian symbol, it doesn't have the American symbol, it doesn't have any government symbol, it's just Bitcoin. It seems neutral and new. And look, it's gold, so it's associated with something that we already know. But really, truthfully, if you start looking at what Bitcoin is all about, it's something more like this. A room, a servers, people mining Bitcoin. In 
a room like this, and in computers like this, and using computing power like this, that is at the core how bitcoins are created. There's a very complicated algorithm that must be solved by a computer. And there will only ever be, in the history of all bitcoins, 21 million. So all that these computers and servers and nerds like me have to do is buy a little mining software, get some kind of machine, there's plenty of those that you can buy, mine Bitcoin, but the more that are mined, the harder it comes to mine one, and whereas before it might have taken 30 seconds to mine a Bitcoin, now it can take months, years, who knows how long it'll take from now on. So that's why it's an interesting alternative paradigm for a lot of people to understand, and that Whenever mainstream people, I think of uh, channels like CNBC and uh, CNN.com will run a big thing on Bitcoin, what is it? And you have people who are not really in the know about how the currency is created or used, they can't really fathom the idea that something that is used as a medium of exchange could exist only digitally. So if we can present this idea of Bitcoin as being mined and people having to do work in order to earn it, it helps. But then again, it's something that's still very complicated. And again, my goal is not to say that there should be mass adoption of Bitcoin across everywhere. Even though that would be great, I think my point is more that I believe Bitcoin is a promise. It gives us a lot. It gives us something that we have not had before and something that we can use to our advantage. Now, there are a lot of charts that you definitely see all over the internet. Uh, this is one that just shows you total bitcoins in circulation. As you can tell, we're just above 12 million now, which is about half of, as I was saying before, the number of 21 million bitcoins that will forever be mined. And this is just to show you that it is pretty much a mathematical equation. And that's what makes bitcoin is so interesting, is it's not Ben Bernanke, or uh, Draghi, who's sitting behind a controller like the Wizard of Oz telling you what the price of the money is, or what the interest rates are going to be, or how many they're going to print this week or next week. It's more that it's an algorithm. And as many as people might try to mine them, there will only ever be a finite amount, and will always have to agree with this mathematical calculation. Another one here is uh, showing you the number of transactions per day. This is just from January of this year. As you can see, it started out pretty low. And there's been ups and downs, so it goes, and then we reached our highest peak here in, in the beginning of December, about a week ago. So you can tell that people are really getting involved with it, using Bitcoin to do many, many different things. Now why I, I say Bitcoin is so interesting, and why it should be used by a lot of people, is again, and this is all my belief, everyone has their own reasons for adopting Bitcoin, but this is me personally, I believe it really comes down to it not being controlled by a single person or institution. It comes to not being controlled by governments who exist to tax people, to give people services, to try to fund the various projects such as wars or welfare states or that as it may be. There's no middleman. It's the money and we're able to send it to one or another. It's simple as ever. It's encrypted. It's unbreakable. One thing that I always have to try to iterate to people is there's no such thing as Bitcoin being hacked. You see these all the time on websites like Business Insider, which really hate Bitcoin. They'll always come out with the big headlines like, Bitcoin hacked today, price goes down at 200. It's not that Bitcoin is hacked, it's the exchanges that are hacked. There's no such thing as Bitcoin being hacked. It's virtually impossible. The only way to ever mount this is really to have all the computing power in the world and being, being able to break all the codes and there's really no way that that is fathomable in our age unless people really, really get together. They'd have to be a huge nerd collective and I don't think this can happen anytime soon. Number one important thing for me, is, at least, is it's universal. As you can tell, I'm not Austrian. Sure you won't. I was born in Canada and grew up in the United States and I've had to go back and forth and I studied in different countries so the idea that we can have something universal, that I don't have to go to these shifting money changers, that I don't have to go to the bank and get screwed out of 5 to 10% every single time, that is amazing to me. And I love that. And I love that I can send Bitcoin to someone who's in Nigeria, or someone who's in California, or someone who's standing in the middle of Beijing. I love that idea, and I think it's a great idea. 
Another thing that I'd like to especially re reiterate, and this presentation is more a, a summary of articles that I've written across uh, the internet, across different newspapers that it's been published in, but for me it, it goes down to it being digital and it being something that anyone can access. If we look at banks today and most of our bank transactions, we're all doing it online, we're all doing it through use of the internet. When we talk about governments printing money, we don't mean that they're firing up the printing press at the drop of a hat, they're entering numbers into a computer. So in that sense, a digital currency is not that far away. And there are a lot of uh, non-profit organizations which are really dedicated to only digital currencies sort of being introduced. And there are some shady groups at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that are really pushing this. You can't always trust them, uh, but I think at least because they're not talking about Bitcoin, this is a good thing which shows that there are good guys and there are bad guys, you know, who follow. Uh, but for the Bitcoin, at least, this is something that is digital, that is decentralized, that people can use. It's something that can, people can use and send, and I, I mean, I could send anyone in this room right now if I wanted to, half of Bitcoin, and you'd be excited to get it. And what will it it'll take? It'll take maybe one cent, two cents of computing power, if that, if I want it to be that quick. If I want to wait a number of times, I can do it for almost no fees at all. I compare that to anyone sending PayPal money. Anyone sending Bank of America accounts or Bank Austria if they're trying to send their money. Thankfully in Europe, we do have the, the European payment system that does make it easier to put that money across, but uh, don't think that your money isn't being tracked and traced by uh, every push of a button. So another point that I have to make about Bitcoin is that because it is digital and because it does exist in these so-called clouds and this peer-to-peer -peer network, we're able to use the tools that we use every day, websites, the internet, our smartphones, to be able to store these Bitcoin addresses. Uh, and I'll show you one later that you can, uh, that you can definitely use and, and, and talk about. But uh, the most important thing is when you have these wallet apps that you're able to send it, there's nobody stopping you, there's no credit card company, you're not having to pay money to Visa, to MySchool, to MasterCard, or whoever these guys may be. So that makes it very, very easy. Now, I first really started getting involved I would put Bitcoin earlier this year. I'd written articles and uh, used it basically uh, on my own time. But then I really started using it to get money that I had in the U.S. And again, I'm not a rich guy, so we're not talking tens of thousands. But to get my money from the U.S. to Austria, where I live now, and do it in the cheapest way possible. And I had tried everything. I had looked at PayPal, I had looked at Diwala, I had looked at you know, Western Union and all these things. And still, there was nothing that would allow me to transfer money, hard-earned money, from one corner of the earth to the other corner of the earth without paying monstrous fees. So I started just looking around, clicking around, finding ways that I could transfer my money. And I was able to finally do it in a way that didn't cost me virtually anything. Now I wrote an article of this for uh, my good friend, Fergus Hodgson. He has the statelessman.com. He allowed me to write this article. And this is something that I believe is very important for the use of Bitcoin, is that we can go around these national boundaries and these middlemen who have been set up basically for what? To make it easier for us to transfer the money? If we have a currency that is universal, that is decentralized, and we're able to send that money without having to go through all these hoops, is that not better for all people who will use that currency or whoever wants to transfer the money? I have a friend of mine from uh, Argentina, and I have helped him take the money out of that country where there are currency controls and it's very hard to move your money, get it into Bitcoin, and bring it back to Austria. Now that's just one tale of one guy, and you know who knows what, what could have happened otherwise, but that was someone who really was faced with a problem, that the government was controlling how much money he could transfer out of the country. But because of Bitcoin, and by using this decentralized network, he was able to take the hard-earned money that he had in Argentina and move it to Austria. And now he's going to a restaurant, he's buying schnitzel, he's, he's drinking Ottokring, and he's doing what the rest of us here do. So my point, and I'm, forgive me for always using the younger generation, I think. Whenever I write articles, it's sexier to do that and to get more Google hits, so I don't have to. But uh, my point, and the promise of Bitcoin, is that we're finally given a type of alternative. Now I have some alternatives because I grew up in the United States and I grew up in Canada. So I have the US dollar 
and the Canadian dollar. But unfortunately, the Canadian dollar is pegged to the US dollar. And they're always going to be just a few cents off of one another. So when I'm thinking about an actual alternative that's not dictated by the Bank of Canada or Federal Reserve, I actually do have a choice. I have Bitcoin. And I know right now it's not perfect. Right now it is not the ideal currency that all of us are going to go and exchange our euros into. Of course not. But it's an alternative. It's something that we have. We have the freedom to choose what type of currency we're going to have. A lot of people don't have those choices. Just like in Zimbabwe, just like in the 1930s in Germany. They did not have an alternative to use. They just had to go to an archaic, or you could say an old system of barter, of not having that principal agreed upon commodity of exchange, whether it be a Reichsmark or a Deutschmark or gold or US dollar or whatever it may be. So I'm not saying that Bitcoin is the answer, but it's a start and it's a, a good way to go. It's a good path to follow and I think if we continue to have that adoption, we'll be good. Now, I did not choose to be in this picture as for an article that I wrote for uh, Young Voices Advocates. They are a global PR firm. They're just basically placing young people who have anything to say uh, all over media, all over the world, basically. And this is from one of the articles that I wrote, and uh, it's a terrible picture. It's just cool. I just did it about Bitcoin. That's what everybody did. All right. Uh, a point that I always have to make again is the young people, or digital natives, I call them. And most of us are very, very familiar with technology, with computers, how to use computers, what we have to do in order to set up a transaction fee, to set up a bank account online, to use a Willhaben or a Willessen. I love that one. Uh, so, one thing that you have to do if you're really going to start getting involved in Bitcoin is you have to make your wallet. Now, a wallet uh, in this day and age can be anything from Electrum, uh, which is my favorite, I believe it's the golden, actually the top one, the Atom. Uh, that's the one that I use the most. It's uh, All of these are free. These are technologies that are put together much like Linux. Basically, it's a crowdsourced, kind of put together over time, so people have really done a good job. You have the Qt app that you can download on your computer. Uh, it's also available on the Android phone. Unfortunately, not the iPhone. I don't know what's going on with these developers, but they seem to hate the iPhone. So really the only Bitcoin apps right now are blockchain, and I think there might be one more that was just introduced like two weeks ago. Either side, I don't know yet, but uh, uh, there are many more that you can choose from. Uh, one of the, the favorite ones I talked about in my article of uh, how to avoid bank fees is Coinbase. It is based on the internet, uh, so that is something that might be for some people a little hard to, <coughs> to get over, but it is one of the easiest ways to get money. Uh, especially in the U.S., you can actually link it up to any kind of bank accounts if you would like. It's also very simple to use. They can print off your Bitcoin address and some stuff. So that's that's one important part that you just kind of have to iterate to people: how you keep your money, um, how you get your money, how you're able to transfer your money. But one thing that everyone who talks about Bitcoin has to face nowadays is the renewed interest, or new interest, or bulging interest in the currency. The only one thing that we always talk about now is the price. How much is it worth? I think uh, looking right now, I have my special app open. Last I saw it was about 850 US dollars. You just see here, 904 US dollars. So we've gone up. That's the only thing that you will hear people talk about nowadays. It was over a thousand just uh, less than a week ago. In the very beginning, it was worth nothing but 10 cents. And this is what the, these fluctuations, and again, we have to remember that Bitcoin has not been around that long. As we can see from this chart, this is uh, just this year. I believe since starting in 2009, we've gone from practically zero to now over 900. And if we keep this focus on just the price, and we allow these politicians to come on television, and these uh, economist nomads who go on and aren't willing to accept alternatives, if we allow them to frame the debate on Bitcoin, then the entire conversation will not be about its usefulness, about how it can be used to transfer money easily without fees in third world countries. It's going to be about the price. It fluctuates too much. That's really all that they're going to talk about, and that's going to be to the advantage of the status quo. So when you're talking about Bitcoin, 
whenever you're engaging people with Bitcoin, it should never be about the price, because the price in the long run is irrelevant. And now, of course, that is what is important. Believe me, I, I bought Bitcoin, uh, some Bitcoin when it was 40 US dollars and oh, went up to 280. Yeah, I sold, I thought it was cool, you make money right away. But the thing you have to realize is that this is a real medium of exchange. It's not just something speculative that you can use like that. It is something that you can use practically. And that's my second part. How many of you know about the dark net? I assume the Bitcoin guys do. Yeah. Very good. So the dark net is a portion of the internet, as they call it. I'm going to be as gloomy as possible. A portion of the internet where drug dealers and people who want to commit crimes gather in secretive back channels protected by types of technology which encrypts their tracks. The most famous place uh, you can probably get onto the dark net is using Tor. Tor project was actually created by the U.S. government uh, by the Naval Research Lab. That is a basically an onward point, and there are other protocols that you can get on. Tor is pretty much the most popular, one of the easiest ones to get onto, and this really allows for people to be protected. Um, a few weeks ago, I was at the Belgrade Regional Conference for European Students for Liberty, and I was uh, talking with Marco Rica, who. I am invited to that, and he gave a great speech on basically why uh, the future belongs to libertarians on the internet. And one point that uh, he was certainly making is that these alternative marketplaces and these, these onion routers and all of these, these different ways of getting online are really there to give people freedom. Give people freedom from the harm that might come if a government tries to clamp down on them and and uh, track their information. Uh, he was telling me a story about Reporters sans Frontières, which is a group, uh, Reporters Without Borders, that go around and they're reporting on all kinds of things and they're trying to see journalists who have been kidnapped or whatever might be going on. So he built a system for them online that was Tor on a small level, censorship evading technology, might we call it. And because of the use of this, Reporters sans Frontières has been able to save journalists in many countries. So it's really not difficult to think that something like the Tor project can be used in the same way. And I, I had to include this little graphic, I found this was interesting. It was on a, an advertising for one of the dark net sites, I mean, one of these marketplaces that was up for about a month and then it went away. It goes, it is the world's best anonymous online drug marketplace. Which is of course how this is always going to be portrayed in the media, as it's nothing for people who want to buy drugs. Free sign up, no fees for purchases, domestic and international, next day delivery, eBay style feedback system. <laughs> and it's silly and it looks so weird, but you know, at the end of the day, that's how it should be, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it be more about peace and having different websites with different clients and competition that is, we're able to use to get products that we like or desire, whether it be paper towels or just a hit of that marijuana? <coughs> So as I was saying, uh, the best access portal for most people, usually most of the time, is torproject.org. Uh, the big drug marketplaces, or dark net marketplaces right now, are Sheep Marketplace, Subroad 2.0, and Black Market Reloaded. And it's very interesting that I'm giving this speech today, because about a week and a half ago, something happened with Sheep Marketplace, and somebody hacked it, or there was a guy who was able to get access to some of the code, so he stole like something like 5,400 bitcoins, which you can imagine is a lot, considering it's 900, oh, it's going down right now, great. <laughs> uh, considering that it's 899 US dollars. So because of that, that really sent a shock throughout the entire system, not to mention the fact that Silk Road, which previously was pretty much the monopoly, uh, for any type of illicit purchases on the dark net. Uh, basically, back then, once it got, again, shut down by the FBI, if you can believe that, uh, there's a lot of contradictory evidence around that, and it seems very shady to me. Um, I'm going to try to write some articles on that. I think it's not really getting much attention right now. But after Silk Road was shut down and exposed by the FBI, and the dark net was, a, was basically brought up into the front page headlines of the world newspapers, you know, people had a place to go to. People had a place peacefully to sit in their living rooms to order a product and have it delivered to them. Another one is Black Market Reloaded, and as of about a week ago, you cannot create a new account on Black Market Reloaded. 
Uh, you cannot create a new vendor account. It's harder for people to sell right now on the website because people are freaking out. Because people aren't really sure what's going to happen. There is uncertainty. And it's mostly come about because people are talking about this more, governments are talking about this more, and people are still not very sure. Again, we have to realize that Bitcoin, dark nets, all this is very new. This is just in the last few years. It's something that pretty much was created after Obama, if we can believe that. So obviously there are going to be a lot of hitches to go through. Uh, it's going to be something very interesting. And again, these marketplaces are marketplaces. That's exactly what they are. They are Amazon. If you go on places like that, you can find books that are banned in several countries. You can ship them to your house. It's very easy to do. And there's a whole system for doing it. Again, it's not about trying to say that this is how all things should be. Because again, assassination market, that's another thing that's come out. You know, should that be okay, being able to, you know, buy a hit on someone? I don't know. I don't make those decisions. I'm not the king of the dark net, nor do I believe anyone should be. But, as you can see, that's kind of the focus for right now, because people don't have alternatives. So if they're able to buy their one ounce of skunk cheese for 4.68 Bitcoin, well, that must have been a long time ago. <laughs> uh, you know, why not? Look how, look at this. What is this? This is Amazon. This is user reviews. This is C vendor. When you click on the vendor's name, what do you have? You have comments. Oh, shipping was late. Shipping was perfect. Oh, this is a controlled delivery. All types of things that you'll find on there that we can find on all types of websites, whether it be Airbnb, uh, Amazon, uh, I don't know what you guys are buying for, the girls use Etsy. Uh, so this is something that is an alternative, and it's an alternative to the system that we have now. It's a peaceful alternative, and Bitcoins really make this go around. Again, it won't be Bitcoin. People can use Litecoin. They can use all types of different cryptocurrencies that I don't even know about yet. But the point is that the medium, if I can quote Marshall McLuhan, who was the Canadian philosopher, the medium is the message. The fact that there is something like Bitcoin means that people have an alternative. It means that people can be free to engage in commerce where they don't have police officers kicking down their doors and, and searching their homes looking for that little shrub of marijuana that you might have bought. We're talking about a peaceful system, something that Bitcoin can, in my opinion, bring us. And if you want to read a little bit more about this and you're very much interested, always go to Reddit. That's the best place right now for all that information. It's like the only centralized hub that you can really find. A lot of the forums are starting to close down on the Darknet sites. Uh, the Silk Road one is still very active, so you can get a lot of information there, FAQs, how it works. Uh, but go to reddit.com slash r slash darknet markets. I can't believe I'm promoting that. But my mom is walking here. <laughs> yeah, dot com, of course. Uh, so that, that's a, a good way to learn about it. And again, I'm not an expert. Um, I will not admit to having done anything on any of these websites, <laughs> but it is an alternative, and it's something that can, people can use, and it's something that I at least advocate for that. So my only point on, on anonymous markets is that we have customer reviews, there's no more violence in the streets, no guns, no force, it's voluntary, and it's facilitated by Bitcoin, this decentralized cryptocurrency that so many government people are scared of, that so many people in the media are terrified of. Now, why I include anonymous markets in my entire talk about Bitcoin is because it is the practical example to learn from this. And whether that tarnishes its image or whether it, it blows it to be something amazing is not of my concern. I'm not the PR person for Bitcoin. There is no PR person for Bitcoin. And that's why it's awesome. And that's why it's great. Because I can dig Bitcoin. Or I can criticize it whenever I want. If I don't agree with a certain exchange or marketplace, I don't use it anymore. I was very critical of Coinbase because in order to get your Bitcoin on the same day, you have to submit to them now a photo ID, your address, your bank account information. This felt like the, the system I, we already live in. I didn't want to go through with that, so I found an alternative. And we have alternatives, and that's the good thing about being able to use cryptocurrencies, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer currencies like Bitcoin. And that's why I, in my own activities as a journalist, I'm trying to use it more and more. When I talk to people who are moving abroad, or you meet who are in 
different countries and they're having trouble moving their money around because of, of governments and apparently now you're not allowed to walk around with more than 500 euros cash in some countries. I mean, it, it's getting crazy and insane. But Bitcoin is an alternative. And that's why the people in Cyprus, whenever their ATMs were closed down by the EU, people were talking about an alternative. And I'm not really sure. There's not really any figures about how many people in Cyprus opened up Bitcoin wallets and were you know, exchanging on Mt. Gox. I don't know how many there were. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. The fact is that they have an alternative now. They can use it, and they can be free. They don't have to have the force of the government telling them that you're not allowed to withdraw this much or that much. So that is my principal reason. That's why I believe the promise of Bitcoin is something very interesting for all of us, young people, old people alike, people who are into technology and not into technology, and I will leave it at that. So any questions, uh, obviously you can email me or send me a Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, thank you guys so much.
you send the money out of the country. Mm -hmm. So you can't track them anymore for the tax they didn't pay, for example. So this might be a problem in the future uh, for for certain nations, like for some Greece right now. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with your supposition. Uh, mostly I would say that I don't, as an individual, really care, because I don't really care about <coughs> money, to be honest. Uh, but and if I were a country, I would be very concerned. And if you had millionaires and billionaires who were only using Bitcoin and were able to transfer it, they could do it. But they can also do that with cash, and they can do that with Swiss bank accounts, and they already know how to do that. If you're rich and you have a lot of money and you're living in Austria and you guys get taxed like, what, 50, 60 percent sometimes, your rich people know what's going on. And they have their money spread out in a way that allows them to keep the most that they earn. Uh, you know, I, it's not really in my interest to uh, talk about Greece's situation, about tax or this. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, that, that's really something that a lot of people might be interested in, but for me, for me I, I seek to empower the individual. Yeah, yeah, but um, it is in my interest that uh, the image of Bitcoin is getting <coughs> better and better. So, yeah, that, that is true. But I mean, there already exists a, a dirty currency that's used for you know, prostitution and drug dealing and all these terrible things, sure. and it's cash. Okay. Sure, but I mean, one of the biggest issues um, is always the problem of tax. If you know, if you have a celebrity that uh, you know, is a tax dodger or something, then you know, it's a big thing. And if uh, the mainstream media um, go to go on bitcoins and say, okay, this is a best thing for the rich people to, you know, and then the most people are all, that are not rich uh, be like, okay, this is, uh, this I is a bad thing. I so this is in my interest, actually. I understand your point, and uh, I will. I would answer that two ways. In that, uh, number one, that it just the message has to be that. The problem is not the Bitcoin or this and that, it's the tax system as it exists, and it's nation states as they exist, and how they spend the money that they do take in, number one. And number two, if rich people are, are adopting Bitcoin in huge numbers, that means that they're going to start offering a lot of amazing services that we would not otherwise have. So I think that's a positive thing. And again, for the future of taxation, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. If you guys have a better idea, please tell me. I, I wish I uh, had researched that more, so forgive me. Good question. Okay. Um, once the 21 million bitcoins are created, and uh, we're still living in a world where the volume or number of goods is still increasing, that means uh, we will have constant deflation from then on. Uh, do you consider that as a problem? You know, I do, and that's why Bitcoin will be superseded by another currency. I don't really have to worry about that. Okay. It's more, again, that's my point is not that to cheerlead for Bitcoin itself. It's the technology, it's the capability, it's the universality. And if that can be applied to anything else, that's amazing. There are people in uh, parts of central Vermont that use these things called time banks. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about that. It's like a barter system. And that's kind of the same way. It's a, a different type of alternative. It's a little weird in my sense. You, know, you clean some guy's carpet and then you take them to the store and then you exchange stuff. I mean, it's an old barter system, but at least this system of using the cryptographic methods and really trying to get people to use peer-to-peer -peer technology, at least that exists, and Bitcoin will be replaced. I have no doubt about that. Creative destruction, it'll go by the wayside, but at least people will have had an alternative. And that's the only thing that I preach. I'm not an economist, uh, not a PR guy, I just am interested in these ideas and I like to talk about them. So. But you bring up a good point. Sorry, <clears throat> it's actually not deflation. It was, it's actually the opposite, because... Deflation. Uh, deflation, sorry. <laughs> We have economists. Yeah. 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 One thing uh, about the uh, technology, um, as I understand it, there is a public ledger, so every transaction can be tracked from the beginning of Bitcoin to uh, yeah anywhere in, in the future. And, and, uh, so what you what you have with your wallet is a pseudonym, but not you're not anonymous. As as soon as uh, the government uh, try to collect taxes or something else, uh, identify as a single node or a set of nodes in, in, a, in a network, it can probably discover other nodes and, and you can be identified and you can be uh, tracked down, right? So, 
I'm not sure uh, how these uh, tax evasion schemes or also the dark net can, can survive if the government chooses to crack down on it. Yeah, and uh, you're talking about the blockchain, and anyone can really follow this. If you even take my uh, Bitcoin address here and you put it in blockchain.info, you can see all the transactions. I mean, this is like a spare uh, Bitcoin address, but that's what most people do, is they have three or four Bitcoin addresses, and uh, new ones are created. Coinbase, for instance, allows you to create at least five at one time, and you're able to use them in interchange, and it all goes to one wallet. And it is very true that it's not an anonymous currency. And I made the point about anonymous markets and then the alternative currency, because it is true that you can, with forensic accountants, track down exactly uh, what, where the money going is where, or only by the wallet. So it's not Yael Osowski gave this guy 0.1 Bitcoin. Sure. But I, I agree, and that's something that will have to improve in the upgraded version of Bitcoin, right? Therefore, there will be zero coin, right? There will be zero coin. Zero coin? Yeah. I think. Is that a new one? I don't. Know. Yeah. So, which okay. is unprincipled. Okay. That could be good. Yeah. I think January, February, I, I just read it off. So. See, that's the thing. These things are like so new, you don't really know. And yeah, yeah. There are always new ones being created. It's just that Bitcoin right now happens to be the one that is most equipped to deal with all this interest. That's a good thing. At least for me. Well, the thing is with Bitcoin, you mentioned earlier that about 5,400 Bitcoins got stolen. So, what happened? What can one do regarding Bitcoin security? So, what do I do? Do I carry my hard drive with me everywhere I go? Or do I put it on the cloud somewhere? Or do I put it in, I don't know, upload it in BitPay or somewhere? Like, yeah. what, what do I do to actually protect? Well, again, that was, that was not the fault of uh, Bitcoin. That was the fault of cheap marketplace. Uh, I keep my wallet just like on a simple USB drive. right? So it's portable, I can carry it with me everywhere, and it's backed up in clouds and mega and Dropbox and everything I can think of. So that's not a problem, but it is the exchanges and it's the marketplaces that you have the problem. The problem with cheap marketplace is that more people, for some reason, trusted cheap marketplace in such a fashion that they were willing to upload 50 Bitcoin, 5 Bitcoin, and they would leave them on the servers of Sheep Marketplace. So because all the Bitcoins were in one place, all a guy had to do was tap into that and he had all the access. And there are really, really interesting articles, on, especially on Reddit. Reddit is perfect for amateur detectives. And they were able to track this guy down, and they've been tracking him for this guy who stole all the Bitcoins. They've been tracking him down ever since. Seeing how much he's sending here, and it's millions of, of dollars that they're talking about. Euros or whatever they be. So they've been able to track him through the use of the blockchain. Yeah, but Bitcoin security, there are different ways. You can memorize uh, just a sequence of numbers and names if you want. That can be your Bitcoin wallet. You can print one out and it's only on paper. You can have it just on your USB drive, just on your Dropbox or wherever you may be. And that's kind of how people can do it. Really, security comes down to the people that you deal with. Exchanges. Now, if you guys are interested in Bitcoin and you really want to get into it now, the best thing to do is go to localbitcoins.com and find these guys in Vienna who sell them. There are probably two or three that are right now in the city center. So you can just go to them, you have an exchange, you transfer whatever the amount of money is for the Bitcoin, and you do it right there. It's peaceful, no problem, and it's done without use of all these exchanges, Mt. Gox, Coinbase, Duala, whatever. So in that way, it's safe and secure because you're dealing person to person. So I think that might be the future, but again, it's not convenient for everyone. Because I don't have time to go to Stefan Platz and like meet with the guy. And I have other stuff to do as well. That's a valid point. Yeah. Sorry, uh, you were talking about mining Bitcoin? What does that mean exactly? Uh, mining Bitcoin is when you're trying to solve that complicated algorithm. Uh, you know, again, I don't know the algorithm because I'm not a computer science guy. Uh, but basically, it's a very complicated mathematical equation, algorithm, that the computer has to try to solve. And as we get closer to 21 million bitcoins, the harder it comes to solve that, and the more computing power you'll need. So that's why you have entire rooms filled with servers that are trying to do this. And I mean, to be honest, what most people sell on bitcoin, other than drugs, obviously, is bitcoin miners. So it's basically just something you set up, you plug in, you don't just mine all day long. <coughs> It takes a lot of electricity and power, but still, at the end of the day, you can get half, again, and I don't know the time, it's maybe half a Bitcoin for a month or something. You guys ever mined Bitcoin, anyone? You, you guys tell me, I don't know. How, how uh, take 10 minutes, there are 25 Bitcoins, and one of the miners get. 
And so but it's random. It's random. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's random. But if you have more uh, computing power, you have better chance to to get this uh, 25 bitcoin. So you don't get one bitcoin. You either get 25 bitcoin or nothing. Yeah. And so, uh, and every 10 minutes, uh, you start is starting, and you can uh, someday is getting this 25 bitcoin. Yeah. And uh, just like a lottery. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a lottery, and that leads to um, you need to wait very long and uh, to get someday uh, 25 bitcoin. So. Uh, some miners uh, uh, cooperate together and uh, building a pool, it's called. And, uh, th and they say if one of this pool is getting the 25 bitcoin, they share it in this pool. So if you join uh, such a pool, you don't have, yeah, you don't get the 25 bitcoin. In all, but you get uh, a lesser part, but you don't have to wait, I don't know, two years to actually find. Do you know anyone who's gotten the 25 bitcoins? Sorry? Do you know anyone who's gotten the 25? No. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you're joining a pool, you get every, yeah, yeah, I don't know, every hour, hour uh, a small part of a bitcoin. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah. And whoever wrote this white paper was ingenious to come up with mining, because that's exactly it. You know, you're Digging for gold all day long, and then you find a huge nugget, and you're rich. So technically, what you're saying is we know when the 21 million threshold will be reached. But it is the 21 million will be reached. Yeah, yeah. it's it's so far away. Nothing to worry about. No, it. Yeah. You said it's 2140. 2040. No, 2040. There will be 20 million. I am okay. And then then it's it, it needs very long. So yes. because yeah. every every four years mm -hmm. uh, the re reward uh, is getting halved. So uh, at the beginning you get you got fifty uh, no or fifty, uh, 50 bitcoins, and mm -hmm. then four years later in two thousand twelve in December I think mm -hmm. uh, you there was a, a change. Now you get twenty five bitcoins, uh, and uh, now we have one year more and. Uh, three years later, so in 2016, I think it gets half again, so you just get 12.5 Bitcoin and so on. Every, every four years it gets half. And I have trouble with today's mind. So basically what happens is you get fewer and fewer Bitcoins for spending more and more uh, computing power together. And this is, this is maybe a problem because uh, as I understand it, the computing power that you put into mining is, is used for securing the transactions. So when when the reward uh, gets too little, people will just stop mining and uh, the blockchain will not be secured. Right? Yeah, no, no uh, you must uh, follow the more Moore's law. It was, I think, that mining Bitcoin is going half, half, half because Moore's law says that every, uh, every one. Uh, So Bitcoin, let's uh, say, yeah. we must, we must, if, if the computers are more and more uh, uh, yeah, faster, then you then you have a little less time on mining. Mm -hmm. So then the, the time of mining is through the technology development is reduced, and so we can for more, uh, for less time, more Bitcoins. Yeah, and if I talked about that, you guys would have been bored to tears and falling asleep. <laughs> so thankfully, the knowledgeable people are here, and they can explain it to you afterwards. So that's much better. I'm only here to explain basically the narrative of Bitcoin, why I think it's interesting. And you guys have the technical know-how, which is great. We need that. A lot more than politicians. <laughs> I mean, if we only see transactions in the Bitcoin miner, uh, Bitcoin miners and drugs, um, what was the point of it? If I can't buy I don't know, a printer online. You can. I, well, I that's another point I should have included is that there are plenty of marketplaces where you can buy all sorts of items. Um, you can buy printers, the paper towels, and you, you can buy all types of different things like that. It depends on the website, and again, they're constantly changing. Right now, it's mostly based in the US, unfortunately, but most of the first people really to adopt it are hosting, serving people, to people who can 
you know, help you host a website, WordPress, for instance, started accepting Bitcoin, Reddit now accepts it for, for people online. And then in Berlin, they have a lot of these restaurants where you go and you're able to use your Bitcoin. So it is true that's, that is one bad thing is you say, hey, I can't pay my rent with Bitcoin, right? I can't uh, buy a, a car or gasoline with Bitcoin. And that is true, and you can't do that right now. But that's not to say that it won't happen very soon. And there are plenty of new websites that are happening. There's a whole list on Bitcoin.org, uh, and then you go to the, actually it's the wiki page for Bitcoin, and it has a list of tens of thousands of websites where you can buy all kinds of stuff. And for, for right now, it's, it's too complicated to buy everything that I, I have in Bitcoin. Because first of all, because I don't make Bitcoin. You know, I don't, nobody pays me in Bitcoin. So it's hard for me to go and do it that way. And that is true for everyone. And that's one reason why it's difficult for the everyday population to try to adopt it. And that's why by talking about it, using it more, hopefully we can get more people to adopt. Yeah, there is a website, it's called uh, coinmap.org. Yeah, I don't, yeah, it's, it's okay, but still, yeah. you can't yeah. know all of them. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a map of the world, and there are many uh, locations uh, shown on the map where you can buy from the countries. You can buy flowers in Bitcoin, I've done that. Yeah, but, but it's not complete, but it's a nice... Uh, we'll do the uh, overview where maybe I can find something. Plus, they have bit pay and stuff. Or, yeah, that's true. But there, uh, the bit pay and our fees, tiny fees, of course. But it makes it very convenient for people who want to go and buy sushi or shrimp. There's a Forbes reporter in uh, San Diego, I believe, who lived for I think two weeks or something completely on Bitcoin, and she was able to go to the grocery store to go to a bunch of restaurants all with Bitcoin and. Obviously, it's San Diego, and it's a very you know, nerdy place where people are doing that more. But you can't do that right now if you go to Mints and try to buy stuff in Bitcoin. It's not going to happen. I don't know where you can buy it or anything. That's, that's one thing. One more thing. Uh, is, is, uh, I, I see that uh, stores are accepting Bitcoins, but is anybody actually pricing their stuff in Bitcoins? I mean, uh, or are they pricing it in euros or dollars or whatever and, and, and just calculating how much a Bitcoin is worth? Because, as you say, if you want to live one week off of Bitcoin, with these changes in the price, you, uh, you, you gain or lose a lot of purchasing power, mm -hmm. purchasing power during that week, right? Yeah, that's true. And for right so, now, I don't think there are many people who do that. Who price right. off so so it's, it's, a, it's a payment network that, uh, that's the way value behind this, but, but why would anyone want to hold bitcoins except for speculative reasons, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why they, they would want to hold it or, or to spend it. In a, in a way, the most important thing is that it's used as a medium for exchange. And again, whether the dry cleaner prices it as half a bitcoin for three dry for three shirts or uh, you know 20 euros or something. For right now, in the beginning, it will always be difficult to set a Bitcoin price. Just like whenever Germany installed it, the new currency, it was really hard in the beginning to have... I mean, it's going to be difficult, and it's hard. And as an entrepreneur, if I knew a lot more about it, and I had the resources, I would find a way to use that to my advantage. And there are people who, especially uh, these servers and computer guys, who do price everything in Bitcoin, and obviously it does fluctuate. You know, as it well should for the moment. And the stability will be the number one toughest thing to get people on. And there's not an answer for that other than mass adoption, more people using it, not less people, and governments stop threatening it. <laughs> and it will allow people to have confidence in it, which really is all that matters at the end of the day, is that people have confidence in it. So this is just one measure of confidence that I'm instilling into Bitcoin. It's very different uh, for an entire government agency, or in Germany, for instance, where uh, Frank Schaeffler, is that right? Schaeffler, who uh, sent a federal inquiry to the government asking, can Bitcoin be used? Is it money? Is it private money? And they answered yes. And that was a very, very important decision. You know, does that translate over? Not really. I mean, it shows up on the FDB web, FDB <coughs> web pages and stuff, but I don't think that will cause mass adoption. Are there currently any legal issues known with accepting Bitcoin for payment? As a business, you mean? Or? 
Yeah, like if I were to open a, sh a store, is there anything I would need to consider when offering Bitcoin as a payment method? Yeah, it depends where you are. Um, I know that in the U.S., the places in New York City, where they've started to accept it, they've had some troubles. Because in places like that, they have to pay a city income tax. It's insane. For me. Uh, so that is very hard, and a lot of times, especially with political campaigns that the candidate I was talking about earlier, they always have to translate it. Okay, I accepted 0.5 bitcoins at the moment, it was worth whatever, 30 US dollars or something. I don't know, it's really different by every single jurisdiction, and there are people who do it, and it's still pretty much unknown. I'm assuming by tax time, come April, we'll find out a lot more about it. <laughs> uh, but again, I wish I knew that, and if you guys are interested in that, and you know about law, tax law, that's a good business to start. You can be an accountant or Bitcoin consultant and know, advise businesses on how to use it. Again, that's not my, it's not my field, I don't know. That's what you guys are there for. A friend of mine living in uh, Germany, and he made a lot of money with Bitcoins. And he said um, he had to hold it for one year, and then it's tax free. This is what so he that's, told a, that's me. in Germany. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know how it's cool. here, but this is what he told me, and he has to know. <laughs> Was he able to cash them out? Uh, um, yeah, a lot of it already, but he's already he's still holding a lot. Be sure you keep him as a good friend and speak to him. <laughs> <laughs> no, my friend ended up saying for one year, so... Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a cool thing. I mean, that's weird, it's like... Yeah, I can't imagine why, but... Yeah, it's, it's like they're in favor of Bitcoin. It's like, well, let's keep the price steady, you know, for about a year, and then you can take it out. Yeah, that's cool. If everybody knows anything about Austria, it'd be great to know. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, if there are no more questions, I'll let you guys uh, get to socializing, get back home, uh, exchanging bitcoins, going to the dark net, whatever you guys want to do. Uh, so I guess thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you to Austrian Libertarian Movement. Have a good night.